kids have cut into their cell phones and into their computers is astounding. They almost trust everything Siri says more than they trust their own brains. We, on side proposition C, as a government, that we can take this and use it to our significant advantage, along with the, the, um, the increase in technology that our society faces today. With all of this in mind, we are so proud to propose a motion for us today. Now, as your first proposition speaker, I'm going to be doing a few things. I'm going to provide a model, define some terms, and get into our conceptual speech. So, what do, what do we have here today um, as, a, as some definitions? Well, we define this house as Western democracies um, and laws as lethal, autonomous weapon, weapon systems. And as the police, we, want, we're, we don't want this debate to be about military force. We're only talking about civilian usage and we're not talking about like using these laws in the army, right? Now, what about a model? Well, we tell you that we wouldn't authorize all laws to have um, to authority to authorize, to use lethal force, right? For example, the laws of policing community wouldn't like be lethal laws, right? And you use them in situations of significant where there's significant lethal threats to the people, and the norm, um, um, and the normal police force would be allowed to do these things, right? And we're going to have a transition where we don't just put these laws in at one time, right? We're going to introduce them into the police force slowly. But second, but furthermore, we tell you that there's going to be different laws for the different kinds of weapons and the different types of robots, right? Now, with that settled, with the model, with the models, um, with the model there, let's get into my constructive speech. No, thank you. Well, I have two points for you. Today. Firstly, I'm going to be talking to you about how this is going to make a more effective police system, and secondly, about how it reduces the danger of the police. And then my partner Sayang will be talking about her constructive points. Now, let's get into my first point of how this is more. We essentially think that robots, and we think that these laws aren't bound by human limitations, right? We don't think you can argue that they are. We tell you that first of all, on the most basic level, and the most basic principle, they don't need food, and they don't need sleep. So we think that a lot of errors in this sense can be mitigated, right? We think that a lot of cops and a lot of police officers make bad decisions on bad days, where they woke up on the wrong side of the bed, but they didn't have enough sleep, or didn't have the perfect coffee in the morning, right? So we think on this basis, we mitigate that, that significantly. But secondly, we tell you that these that these um, these laws can assist cops, right? We don't think that they'll be the ultimate decision makers, but they can be there for first of all a second opinion, and secondly, like if for example you need to launch a missile, you don't need to know how to do that because the law will do it for you, right? And on that basis, we think that it's safer because you have something that's trained impeccably to do so, right? Um, but lastly, we tell you that robots don't fear the way that humans fear, right? In a lot of situations, police are under high-stress um, situations, and thus they, they, their rationality is clouded by their emotions. But obviously, when we have these laws in place, they yeah. won't be feeling the same type of way, which you would seem to be The law protects these robots from making mistakes. However, I mean, if they are making mistakes, it's not going to have any consequences. This is going to only create distrust between the government and the people. Well, the thing here is I told you in my model that each law will have its own law. And I'm talking about like legal laws and then the laws. <laughs> so we think that on that basis, we will work to see what the tangible areas of the machinery is and work from there to create laws that will create justice for the people, right? We tell you that. No, thank you. We tell you that on that basis, we're going to work to make this the most effective system, the most trustworthy system that we can. But getting further into this point, where I tell you that a robot doesn't feel any emotion, they don't feel scared, they don't feel stressed, so you can always go to them for a second stable opinion in a situation, or you can go to them to make the ultimate decision. No thank you, right? So we think that on that basis, these, these um, laws are going to make our policing system more effective and the police themselves more effective. No thank you, I will no longer be taking any more laws. Now I want to tell you why these, these laws are important and why it's important to have a good police force. Well, first of all, obviously, on the most basic level, when you have safer police, you have more rational police who have a safer community. But secondly, we would tell you that they can now significantly uphold the laws and the stance of the government, right? You think this is a trickle-down effect that the stance of the government is established and entrenched in society where these laws know exactly what the government wants because they've been programmed to They've been programmed to like emulate this. We think on that basis, you have a society that reflects the stance of the government, and we think that you can't do that with people because you can't simply tell a person what's right and wrong and expect them to always like listen to that choice or that decision that you've made for them, right? We think that because we have a police system that already works on a basis where there is a one right answer, there is a good decision in a situation that these laws are the most effective way to do this. But now let's get into my, construct, my second constructive point of why this is going to reduce the danger for police and why that's a good thing, right? 
First of all, the government will assess like what situations are like, sorry, the police force will assess what situations th these laws need to be used in, right? They will assess when regular police officers will be less effective in the situation. But, but we want to stress the fact that they're not mutually exclusive, right? You can have the laws with the police force, and that's why we think this is really important. You're not going to be just like ruled by robots, right? We think that on that basis, this is really effective. We think the situations where these laws will be used are examples that are actually like threatening the police, and there's actual terrible threats to the police, right? For example, in hostage situations, in gang fights, where you need to be safe, and these and these laws and these robots are very effective methods of keeping you a safe and b making the right decisions, right? We think that when you employ robots, if they get hurt, you know you don't have like one less police officer, you just need to fix them. But secondly, they won't make the mistakes that will put you in the situations where they're getting hurt, right? They'll reduce that threat, and we think that that's going to reduce the danger of police officers. Ultimately, it's going to like save lives of the police and make them like make them more stable minded. But why do we care that the dangers for police is reduced? First of all, we tell you that with this resolution you can have more specialized training. So instead of focusing your time on learning how to launch a missile, you can learn how to assess the situation more properly. We think that that's going to make these police better at making decisions and better at the necessary skills that they need in their everyday like in their everyday life experience on their job, right? So they're gonna focus on the skills that they need, so that's going to make them safer and more confident in their abilities. That makes them more co like confident police officers, which we think is a really good thing. But secondly, but secondly, we think that's gonna incentivize others when they know that they're not going to be blamed for like when they know they're gonna have a second opinion. Um, in situations where there's high stress, right? Because that incentivizes people to like work hard to be good police officers and um, join the police force. But second, but lastly, we need we need secure police to make the right decisions. And when you make the right decisions in such circumstances, you feel safer, you feel confident with your choices because you know that you have somebody, you have some something which could be a somebody that is telling you exactly uh, like what should be done, but is only there for a helping hand, right? So what have I told you today? I clarified to you why this is going to be more effective. These robots do a few things, and in situations of stress, they are not likely to make the wrong decisions. Where humans, we have learned time and time again, do that thing. And that's a large part of our police system today, and that's all we need to really do. But lastly, I told you why it's important that we have the police, we have police that are confident in their decisions, and know exactly what they're going to On that basis, there's so much. <laughs> Opposition come to you with the burden to uh, prove that policemen are the best people to do their jobs, and that is why we today stand so proud to propose today's solution. So, before I get into my three arguments, which is going to be one, ineffectiveness, two, accountability, and three, I'm going to video and come up here and talk to you about the nature of the laws and why we as a principle believe that these are completely illegitimate. I'm going to do a bit of a bit. Um, so let's start with a bit of modeling. Because really we just got this really shallow idea of how these people or how these robots are going to be implemented. We were told that this would be in significant lethal situations, but there wasn't really given any examples. We also didn't hear to what extent that these people that these robots would be able to use their force. Like of course they're not going to be able to use missiles, so that's the only thing we heard. But we say that policemen essentially can't do that today anyway, so we don't really get the point. What we need to hear from you is how much force these people are going to be able to use because there was given no mechanism for that. So essentially the entire speech that we got from the team uh, proposition today was all based on the consensus that in the police uh, uh, in the police workforce, there's only one right answer to everything. There's only one right move that you can make. We here fundamentally believe that as a wrong assumption. We believe that because if it was if this was true, then why don't we just train every police officer to act in a certain way in every single situation? So if you agree that there's always one way, right way to do this and to do this one right answer, then I challenge you to tell us 
why the police officers they can't do it anyways. But on the second, uh, but on the second thing, they but um, but since you do believe that we need to teach other people to do to do this one right answer, you're essentially thinking that we can create some sort of artificial intelligence who's able of making better decisions than we are. I have not yet heard of any sort of, uh, of any sort of technology having uh, been, uh, having been developed to this extent. So we're saying that's basically not going to happen. Um, we're telling you that these kind of uh, we're telling you that these kind of laws is not going to be able to make these like uh, situation based as uh, situation based as decisions. We're saying that they're going to be acting on the most like instant and effective way to live, the way that they just view the situation. This is what I'm getting more into in my arguments, and not where I'm going to prove to you why these why it is harmful when the entire situation is not taken into account. So. Let me move into my first argument, which is this whole ineffective point. No thank you. So what we hear, uh, what we hear first down to trick you is that these robots aren't capable of effectively evaluating the situation. Well, we're saying that if a man stands with a uh, if a suicide bomber stands with a bomb, promising that he's going to jump in any minute, then we say that the artificial robot will go and be like, oh, 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 you know what? There's a man saying he's going to uh, detonate this bomb. We better kill him. We're telling you that when a police officer will see this, he will have it in his power to be able to possibly talk this man out of it. We're saying that the policeman will know that this man is a threat and then shoot him if that is necessary. But we're also saying that we give you the opportunity to save this suicide bomber's life. That we're giving the opportunity for the policeman to talk him out of this. That we're saving someone's life. We're saving someone who would else be doing it. We're telling you that we're creating a better society in which uh, in which these wrongful decisions are not being made. Because we're saying that most people who stand and are ready to jump, ready to jump off a bridge, ready to shoot someone, are capable of being told out of it. We're saying, no, thank you, that a robot would be incapable of making these sort of situation analysis of if he's going to do it, is he not going to do it, and how do we ultimately um, okay. uh, create a loss on the crime scene. No, thank you. So, further, moving on to a second one, is that these people cannot, um, uh, cannot deal with the force that they need to do. Uh, cannot deal with how much force they're supposed to use. Because how much force? Uh, because how? Um, and this in, uh, again ties back to the whole situation. Here. Because what if this thing is being done in self-defense? What if you see two people? Um, uh, what if someone? Is, uh, what if this thing is going to be? Uh, done in such a sense. We said that ultimately these robots will only be able to evaluate like the objective wrongly. Like, oh, he has a gun, we need to do something, instead of going further into the situation. We say that the most areas of crimes are more complicated than that, and that's why we need the human evaluation, because the humans understand the humans. That's what I'm going into in my second option. So our third top witness is really just how police men do these better. And why is this true? But well, we're telling you that policemen have these, this incentive to do their job better. Right. Policemen are humans, and ultimately, they need, that means that they have the same human values. And we here on this side of the house don't believe that any human would ever, would, have to, would ever want to do the wrong thing. We believe that policemen would feel horrible doing the wrong, um, committing some sort of crime, not doing their job or, uh, to the very best idea. We're telling you that robots ultimately do not have the same uh, incentive to do their job, well, since they've exclusively been created to do it. We're hence telling you uh, the policemen are ultimately the better at doing their jobs because they have this incentive to do it and because they didn't have this, uh, this understanding of the situation. We're telling you that the policemen can ultimately do the exact same things as the, as the laws, but that they only can do this better. And that, no thing. So now I'm going to move into my second point, which is this whole idea of accountability. And here we are telling you that citizens want to be protected from someone they can identify with. Um, before I continue, yes, I'll take it. Tell me who's more accountable. A police officer under a high stress situation clouded by his irrationality or a, 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 a yeah, thing you think it well, what we're telling you right, uh, on our side of the house is that uh, if this is such a stressful situation, it is probably because there's more to it than just what is objectively happening. We're saying that it's going to be even worse if it's a stressful situation when someone stands with a bomb, as it used to be when the, uh, when the law is just going to say, oh, you know what, we have to eliminate this immediate data. We're saying that when there is an immediate data, the people will, have, uh, will act faster and not have the same layout of reasoning to behind it, the co uh, entire cost benefit. Analysis. So why is it that people want to be protected? Um, uh, want to be protected by people so they can identify? We're saying this is because we share the same values. When humans ultimately share the same values, they feel as if they can identify with people. 
Why is this identification to the police important? Well, we're saying that ultimately the population are the ones who help the police by making their job better. We're saying that the population are the ones who report instances of violence, and hence we need to create this really good connection between the population and police in order to have the most effective police force. We're saying that this is not going to be have, uh, help with the robots. Now, why is this? Well, we're saying you know, that with a robot, you have no one to hold accountable. If a robot does do something wrong, as we see happening multiple times, we see that airplanes fail all the time. We see like there is there is many coincidences in which machines do not work optimally. And we see that when this does happen, then it's irreversible. There's nothing you can and there is absolutely no one you can hold accountable for this. With a policeman, you can go and you can say this guy did this his job wrong. That means that he'll no longer be able to do his job. He will get fired. But with a robot, you can only go and say, uh, um, so, uh, ultimately, we have to believe that you will lose faith in the justice system, and that's what we have to do. Speaker, no one can deny the importance of having laws that are there. And we think that justice can be best and can only be served when these laws are also well enforced. So we must encourage innovation that helps improve policing, thinking that laws are one such avenue for such progress to occur. To this effect, we have three main lines of analysis that we've brought to you on the government bench today. First, Democrat Ms. Warren talked about how this will lead to more effective police. And secondly, she also spoke to you about why this will make it safer for police in general, and all the, and all the benefits that come as a result. What I'm going to be doing is giving you the third line of analysis about why this is so important to minority groups and about social relations between policing and uh, other groups as well. But before I do that, I want to get into the very thorough reputation that we've heard come out of the first opposition speaker. The first part was kind of ineffectiveness. They told us that, for example, police officers can talk to suicide bombers and talk them out of their decisions while robots cannot understand because of human, human emotions. And we thought we made it very, very clear in Simran's speech that we want these laws to be used in conjunction with police officers as a supporting force. And it's obvious for this, for this particular situation with the suicide bomber that we want negotiators on hand. But secondly, they also told us that robots don't have an incentive to do, job, to do their jobs well. All right, we have two responses to this. Firstly, we said that they're programmed to do their jobs well, like they are robots, yes, they do not have like human emotions, but at the same time, like technologically, that's what they're programmed to do. But moreover, we think that many, many police aren't necessarily incentivized to do their jobs to the fullest extent, and often they're prevented from doing so, because, for example, just the example someone gave you, um, they fear for their own lives, and as a result, they're not able to make strong yeah. decisions and talk about the decisions that robots can. No, thank you. Their second point is that accountability, like how there's a risk of error. And we agree, but there's a risk of error that is far, far less than the area that often occurs. For example, like people, when people are sleep deprived, they might not be able to make the best decisions because this isn't a problem that you have on the government front. But more of a real range, we'll that they're going to be used in conjunction, but we don't think this is still an issue. And then they tried to bring up the model pick in their first speech. They said that we're not really sure in which situations they'll be able to use lethal force. We thought this, we made this very, very clear in Simmons' model when she showed specifically that we would employ lethal force with laws when, they, when there is a significant danger to civilians. The example that we would give you about this is, for example, the gang fight that occurs. No thanks. So now that I've done a thorough reputation of their case, I would really like to get on into some new constructions. At first, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of effective policing. She told me, she told me that, we, that robots are not going to be bound by human limitations, like speed, speed to crime, for example. And she also told you that they're going to be very, very valuable because they provide a second evaluation of the current situation. The only response we heard on the, on the, on the, on the opposition side is that, firstly, that, that laws, um, there's not only one right response or right response to a certain situation, that secondly, um, that, they, that they never heard of such technology existing and it's not possible to do that. Okay, we think that there is like a best way to respond to a certain situation, and that laws can still respond in a variety of ways that we were told in the last time. But secondly, like, we think that technology exists based on the information that we were given for this debate. No, thank you. 
And so we're all taught to you about why this will lead to safer policing. The result is that when you have these laws implemented in dangerous situations, police are less likely to shoot first when asked questions later, because they are less likely to be emotionally compromised and to act in a way that is very bad. She told you that there is going to, there, that they were going to be much more confident in their decision in the decisions that they made. And unfortunately, this was completely dropped by the opposition side. We never heard any sort of response to this whatsoever. All right. So now I want to talk about the third line of analysis that we're going to review, about the importance of this um, resolution to minority groups in particular. So we tell you that first of all, humans do have things like innate biases. They do have like innate racial, like gender or age prejudices that they have. And this is incredibly problematic when police do have a monopoly on power and violence in a society, in a society that's support, that is supposed to enforce these sorts of laws and have full these on this. We see that in many, many communities, citizens don't really trust the authority as a result of these biases that we know police officers tend to harbor. When you have laws employed, you're going to have a more impartial arbitrator of situations. You're going to have improved relations between minority groups that are often targeted and police, um, and because like laws are going to be monitoring the actions of police, police are going to have like less social fragmentation overall. And they're going to be able to better evaluate and assess the situation by providing a second opinion like we told you. Uh, I'll tell you that, I'll take a minute, that this is huge social impacts. If the situation is so life-threatening, is there really time for a second opinion for the police and laws to work in conjunction? Okay, I tell you that first, actually I'm going to get back to this later in my speech, but we tell you that first of all, in life-threatening situations, we tell you that often, oftentimes police are not in a good position to be making the sort of decision when their own lives are compromised. That's why we want to have laws in conjunction with that, because they do provide like a good assessment of the situation. Okay, so let's talk about the massive social impact that results at the, um, that come about as a result of this um, quotient. So that first of all, I want you to give to the example, the example of black people in America, who often feel discriminated against, and having laws um, used in conjunction with the regular police force is a source of reassurance there will be another entity that will independently evaluate the current situation, and that they can respond appropriately. No, thank you. And secondly, we see that this will help reduce the prejudice currently held by police. No thanks. If the ways that the laws assess the situation seem less dangerous than they thought it was, and it'll help people realize the fallacy in their preconceived notions. But for, thirdly, we say that it's a very, very good resource to have laws on hand because they can help um, they can help resolve cases of things like police uh, alleged police abuse of power. This would have been very, very helpful, for example, in the Michael Brown case, as laws have analyzed the situations and been able to like. And this would, be, would have been very, very useful in determining culpability in that particular scenario. We think that overall, when you have laws employed in conjunction with the regular police force, you're going to have decreased social fragmentation. Minority groups are often discriminated against, or they're given the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to give you, like, for example, I'm less likely to be searched, um, to be searched um, in New York than, a black, than an African American man. But we think that when you have laws that are able to assess these situations, you have a more independent assessment of, what's going, of the actual scenario, and you don't have these sorts of frequency biases that are inherent to human beings, like police officers. The results is that you have greater equality, and this is a very big good thing. It's, only the, it's like a major benefit that we provide by using these sorts of innovative technology and on campus. Mr. Speaker, today we told you, first of all, that it's going to more effective policing, because laws aren't bound by human limitations, that they can provide a second evaluation of the situation, and our second line of analysis, was that this will be much, make it much safer for police and <coughs> more likely to act in rational ways because their lives aren't being constantly threatened. We also told you about the importance that the huge impact this will have on minority groups who already like either distrust the distrust the, distrust the authority and seem to like good social dimensions. Overall we think that we can all these benefits on our side of the very really proud for those. <laughs> I would like to ask the leader of opposition, the floor is yours. Thank you. 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 Honorable judges, why does the second or why does the first world war have such a negative stigma, historically speaking? It is because that is the time when there was a transition into impersonal warfare, when it no longer was a man against a man fighting for ideology, fighting for different belief. It was impersonal. There were gas masks. There were different things happening. Impersonal warfare is something that we hold in contempt in retrospect now today. 
Why is there such a controversy about CCTV? It is because a government spies on its population. They have no way to defend themselves, no rights to privacy. We think this is a large side of the harm on their side of the house. This is only an extension of this controversy. This is only an extension of that negative stigma that I have just described in my intro. We are, on these grounds, so proud to oppose this motion today. Now, I'm going to do a few things for you to hear today as deputy opposition here, or whatever I'm called, uh, <laughs> I'm going to reconstruct some of the points, like the points about the, how this could be an ineffective, and second of all, how this basically is, uh, why we value the person-to-person -person relationship that the police has to its people. Also, I'm going to bring you a very important point about basically why the nature of laws and why they are illegitimate in the first place. I'm going to talk to you things about these things like privacy and basically why this is a huge, huge harm. Now, before I do that, I'd like to get into some rebuttal of what we've just heard, that basically this will actually improve relations between the fragmented groups like minority groups and the government. But, okay, I have a couple responses to this. So first of all, in Simran's speech they said that another like, huge benefit of this, alleged huge benefit of this, is that the government essentially can program these robots to basically exerting the law that they find appropriate. How, if there is an adversarial tie between the government and a certain minority group, and technologically is technolo technology is programmed according to the government Government set of values, how will they basically feel more safe? This will basically just highlight the adversarial ties that they do have to the government because essentially the government has the influence on what laws basically, no thank you, what laws basically are to be you know enforced, how much like weaponry and like lethal force should be exerted on another point. Another response we have here is something that we'd like to point out. There really was no mechanism or no like chart, no sensitivity analysis on their side of the house on basically when would you use which weapons? This is something that they have fundamentally uh, uh, sorry, ignored on their side of the house. There again, my partner pointed out perfectly that, I mean, the law is not black and white, you know, policing is not black and white. There are things like self-defense that exist. There are things like, you know, suicide bombers, all of these different very sensitive things. Then how are these robots so supposed to be able to accommodate that? They have not given us a mechanism for this. We think this is very, very important in, you know, on any side of this debate, and this has not been clarified, so we're actually really kind of unpleased with that. So how we dealt with why basically minority groups do not necessarily necessarily feel more safe because of and what if the you know the laws would function in extension to the government's arm. What if the government's arm is crooked? Like that is another thing that is not being accommodated for and that is a huge huge harm for these minority groups. No thanks. So basically I'd like to go into some a, a little more like thorough rebuttal of what we heard from the first speaker seminar. So basically effectiveness. Well I've already said that it's not black and white. There are different things to be done. And again the thing about um, <clears throat> But there are different things to be done, um, but I think that I've just actually dealt with that, but again, this is not an effective way of doing it, and actually I'll deal with it, as we've also said in our first speech, that we value that bond between the person and the person, basically, the person policing and the other person policing. We also think it's a very, very important point that sometimes civilians do aid, like, investigations, and do aid, uh, like, police processes because they have some information, like, they see there, for example, a reward in the newspaper, and basically are incentivized to go out and find information and aid the police. Do you really want to aid some, like, a, you know, a piece of machinery that has no anthropomorphic character that we saw on the info site? Like, do you really think that's something that you want to aid in this police investigation? We think it is very important for a civilian population to be able to identify with its alleged protectors. Okay, now going on to her second point about how basically this does improve how this improves the relationship or like the confidence of these like police officers, which she never really defended why this would be so relevant in this motion, because essentially they think that these laws are even more desirable, and they think that, I mean seriously, if teenagers believe Siri much more than they believe any other internet source, the direction that they're implying we're moving in is that technology is really on the rise. So if technology really is on the rise, why do you really care so much about the confidence of these police officers? We think that that's not really a relevant point. Also, we pointed out in a PUI that if these situations are really so life threatening we don't really see how there is that possibility of conjunction, that possibility of like basically like of let me ask this like law machine before I make a decision or vice versa. That doesn't really work. So having dealt with why this doesn't necessarily like incentivize police officers to do any better or to feel more confident, and also why this isn't really ne Question. necessarily more effective, I'd like to go into why laws are illegitimate in the first place. Here I will be talking to you about the secretive nature of these laws, the harms that come from the secretivity. 
And third of all, the improve, uh, sorry, the, why this is important for a government not to do. But before, uh, question. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, for a government not to do this. Well, <clears throat> all right, the secretive nature of laws. Well, here you have a piece of machinery that basically we don't know where it is in the world or like where it is, when it's watching. We parallel this again to CCTV. We don't think uh, in that sense. Well, here, CCTV laws, etc., they take away your right to, per like, to personal privacy. We think this is a problem because suddenly you don't know. Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on. I'll take you in a moment. No, thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll finish this for a second. Okay, so basically your right to privacy is violated. You don't have the opportunity to defend yourself. You also do not like know when you're being watched or not. We think this is a harm. There are many other laws that harm people's privacy. Why are these laws, I mean the robots themselves, which are any different than those legal laws? Okay, well, for example, there are many things that, yes, for example, do infringe on your privacy, but this is being taken to a whole new level. First of all, there's no mechanism here, basically for the people, you know, directly to consent to them being, like, policed all the time. In the same way that CCTV, like, does not necessarily give them the consent because the government has an incentive for these things to stay secret. You know, if everyone suddenly knows that they're being watched all the time, they're going to act differently, and that is like basically something that would weaken that on their part. So, again, because the right to privacy is being taken away, because this is basically important, the government also has an incentive to like basically make sure to protect its citizens, and we on side opposition think that protection not only is security in its most basic sense, security in the sense of like, like no terrorist attacks, all of this, but also basically good life quality, be feeling safe, feeling like you are, can have an identity, feeling that you can go somewhere where you're not always judged or watched or basically spied on. It is for these reasons that we are so hard to propose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Your floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, we think that opposition is right, the bond between the police and the police is a very important one. But we think that that bond is broken down in Western society, particularly within the United States. The reason it's broken down is because people recognize there's a need to balance the right that people who are willing to sign up to be police officers have to self-defense with the responsibilities they have over the use of the state monopoly of violence and lethal force. We think, though, that that attempt to balance overwhelmingly <coughs> due to factors to things like the political influence of police unions, due to things like accountability mechanisms being compromised by the fact that tend to be police or retired police officers who are operating them, means that overwhelmingly that balance shifts in favour of the right to self-defence of police officers. We think that the reasons this happens are understandable, they're natural, but it means that that bond is fundamentally broken down. We think by introducing a character, a group of actors into the equation who do not have to care about self-defense, we massively improve the policing and the relationship between the police and the police in three ways. One, we think it massively improves accountability and transparency issues. Second, we think it improves the trust between the police and the community of people they are policing. And then finally, three, we think it checks subconscious biases that might depend, that might affect the way that lethal force is used, and we think that the consequences of the use of lethal force in those contexts are very problematic. Um, first, uh, one point of rebuttal. So they said there's a problem with this restriction of privacy. Actually, we think that one positive change as a result of, in some ways, response to the Michael Bryan shooting is that there is a more widespread use of cameras on police officers' lapels. We don't think this goes far enough. Um, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, but we do think that this is a representation of the fact that we're willing to actually accept some abrogation of privacy because primarily we're concerned with holding accountable people that are using the state's monopoly of violence in the name of the people they're supposed to be defending. We think that the general population has having their right to self-defense being negated by the fact that we are prioritizing the self-defense of police officers. So in terms of accountability and transparency, one, we think that accountability mechanisms under the status quo are highly flawed. So at the point where they say, well, policemen feel bad if they do their jobs badly, this is the accountability mechanism they offer us. And they say, well, they've got an incentive, and they analogize this to airplane crashes. We're not entirely sure what the incentive in terms of airplane crashes is. We imagine you're suing the airline if the plane crashes. Like, we're happy enough to set up some kind of shell corporation 
under which you could sue the robots. But the important part of laws and autonomous machines generally is you don't have to give them incentives. You don't have to provide them some means of bribery, right? I don't need to bribe Siri in order to do the things I tell it to do. Siri's programmed, more importantly, in terms of holding the actions of Siri to account. Suppose we were to say it's a very good thing to be able to hold people to account because we're using like videos on the lapel so we can see what they're doing. They say, we won't know where these robots are, we have no idea whether it's the case, I can track my phone, so we can track these machines. But more importantly, the difference between holding an officer to account by, by uh, cameras, I mean, one, they can literally just cover the cameras as we've seen in recent cases, but second, more importantly, I can no longer see inside that officer's head. One, so I can't know the decision matrix under which he's making that decision. If it's the case that one of these machines breaks down, I can literally go into the code and see what the problem was. And if there is a problem, I can implement the other one. If you wanted to punish the machine, I suppose you could whip it. But the important point is, we will be able to change this in the future in a way we just can't with human beings. Because the stochastic complications of the way in which decisions are made in the human brain is too complicated to be able to do that kind of thing. But second, under the status quo, when we have accountability mechanisms, it tends to be putting people in front of grand juries, where they're faced by a body of retired cops who say, yeah, this is reasonable, this is reasonable to self-defense, right? You are concerned for your well-being. We don't have that with robots. One, because they don't need to be concerned with their well-being, so they can prioritize what the regs actually say as far as the use of lethal force. They said, oh, gee, you never said what weapons they've used in what circumstances. They don't need to specify that, because there's already rules as regards to policing uh, as, as far as when you would use lethal force. The trouble is those rules are not really followed. One, because they're not necessarily known, because the regs are very long. Like, even if you learn them for some policing exam, it doesn't necessarily mean you will internalize them and be able to apply them in all cases. But second, more importantly, we say that a lot of the time the accountability mechanisms break down because people are sympathetic to officers. They say, well, you were under risk of threat to yourself and your fellow officers, so it's reasonable you would use force under those circumstances. We say that means that the accountability system that exists under the status quo doesn't work, but because people don't have this degree of sympathy toward machines, accountability will be much higher. Um, so second, why is this important for in terms of the way it creates trust between the police and communities? I don't know if there's any Jay-Z fans in the audience, but as you know from 99 problems, one of the problems under the status quo is that police officers can rely on my years of experience as an officer for justifying things like the use of stop and search and other mechanisms of the use of police, uh, uh, police uh, power that we give them under the status quo. We don't think this is necessarily democratic, the reason being they're not necessarily applying the law equally, right? So the point would be vote for certain laws. One, we want them to be applied, and not necessarily just applied depending on the whims of the police officer. We say that's unequal application of law, and we say it's in some ways a violation of the rule of law. But second, more importantly, you don't necessarily know that the reasons under which the police officer moved you over are legitimate ones. We have no way of knowing if the accountability mechanisms don't work, we don't really have any means to hold them to account where they go wrong. Because you do with these officers because you know that they're going to follow the programming to follow the regs they have been given. And when they don't, you can literally just go, go through the code and find out what went wrong. Second, though, this means given there's a resource advantage which has been highlighted by open government that hasn't really been impacted in a positive way, we can literally redeploy resources that we would be sending using on these officers in order to have more things like you know, community policing. More officers on the kind of one to one beat, which means you're more likely to have a personal relationship with the officer that's policing your neighborhood because we're sending these people into the neighborhoods that are particularly dangerous under the status quo. Or second, we're sending them into areas that we don't send people into under the status quo. Why is this? Because certain areas are recognized in many urban areas as being too dangerous to send police officers into. But that means you have a cyclicality in the point where those neighborhoods get more crime and more concentration of violence in those areas because this is known that criminals that the, the criminals aren't effectively policed because the police unions are able to lobby against people being deployed to those areas because the risk is too high. Well, the people that are sent in are the people who are willing to weather those risks but aren't necessarily the correct officers that you want to do so. We say as a result of this, when I have more people that I have a personal relationship with, because there is this redeployment of resources from dangerous zones to you know, more community policing on a one-to-one -one basis with actual human officers, it means that the trust within these communities massively goes up. It means also that you don't have the distrust that comes with not knowing whether when they are using lethal violence, as happened with, say, the Chicago riots in 1968. I don't know whether, for, the, for like, one of the sparks of the riots was there was a gentleman who was a Latino activist who was killed by a rock propelled grenade and hit him in the head. We don't know, still to this day, whether or not it was the police deliberately killing him or it was merely an accident. But you would know with these officers. So the trust, or rather the distrust, that forms under those kind of cases disappears. Finally, we say the subconscious biases are very difficult to control for, right? We don't know what necessarily forms them. It might be the media, it might be people's experiences we think policing when they're used to arresting people of one particular demographic rather than another. But the trouble is, once those biases exist, it's very difficult to control for them. And to the point where I am someone who is under stress, or I am under fear, I'm more likely to act upon them when I'm using lethal force. It's more likely I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later, particularly because training emphasizes that under the 
the status quo. Because there's an emphasis on saying that I have first duty to protect myself and more importantly my fellow officers. Therefore, training under the status quo actually encourages police officers to use lethal force first rather than necessarily training themselves. As they say, the first duty is to protect their fellow officers. And we say, one, like, that means that we have this transparency in terms of. <laughs> Spurting out a lot of words without really explaining them isn't really a way to win a round. But let's look at what the team of improvisation really came up and talked to us today. But before we go into this extension, let me present to you our own extension. Of our own extension. So we propose on opposition that they never really explain to us whether it's only going to be within the police force or it's also going to be on the pirate market. Does it mean that I, as an individual, also can buy these uh, negative machines, right? They never really explain that. But let's assume they do, because they never said otherwise, right? That means two things. Firstly, that individuals also can buy these robots, right? That means it's going to create distrust between two neighbors. Imagine two neighbors having one of these robots each, right? If they go walk over to one another, right, they're going to be confronted with this robot before they can go in. We think it's bad that we're creating distrust between the different individuals, besides creating a distrust between the government and the people, right? But secondly, we're talking about that it's going to uh, also the criminals, right? Because they, we think that it's going to the black market no matter what. We don't think they necessarily can uh, avoid that, right? We think it's only going to increase the crime rate when they're having these uh, robots, and we think that they're going to extend the gang wars because they're having these sophisticated robots, right? We think that's bad for that environment as well. But secondly, we think that for authoritarian state, or maybe even dispersed liberal democracies, which is at the bacon, we're going to have these robots which are going to crack down on riots as soon as they see them. Once we go and riot saying we want more democracy or we don't like this bill, you're getting shot. And we don't necessarily think this is good for either democracy or uh, the two period voice of the people. And if they, no, thank you. If they come up here and explain, well, we can recognize, the robot can recognize whether or not it's a threat or not, we don't really think the law is that simple. The law is not black and white. It says for a police officer that if there is a threat, you can, have, you can get self-defense, right? But what is a threat? That's up to the robot itself. That means the robot has a lot of autonomy and doesn't necessarily, no thank you, doesn't necessarily acquire it with the law. So we think this is bad as well because it minimizes the voice of the people and their ability to express their opinion. Not only dealt with our extension, let's go a look at what their extension was and take it down right away. Now in their extension, no thank you, they talk about we have to send robots into dangerous areas. Two responses. First, we think that these areas are very problematic. And we think that we're alienating these people even more. That means they're going to uh, be alienated from the rest of the society and putting them further back. If we're putting police officers out there in the other camp, we think that we can talk to them, and we don't necessarily think that they're going to be, okay, okay, you talk to me, I'm going to be good again. But we think that, we're, that, we think that uh, these people can be like talking to, and this is what they need in problematic areas, right? No, thank you. Now that we've dealt with that, let's look at what, what, the, what the burden of this debate should be. No, thank you. The burden of this debate in today's debate should be who's the better judge? Is it the police officer or is it the robot? Who's doing the best job? And essentially, they came up with three kind of benefits. So, no, thank you. So, the first one, they talked about these robots don't really need sleep or anything else. We have three responses. Firstly, we talk, talk, told you over and over again that we need this human aspect. 
we need to talk to uh, not talk to a human officer, right? But secondly, we talk we we tell you that they're going to create more mistakes than before, simply because the law isn't black and white. The only thing is not necessarily black and white either in the status quo with police officers. All we are arguing for is that they're not solving that problem. And thirdly, we say for the no thank you, we say for the robots that there's only one way for them to solve a problem. They can't really talk to these human beings. This means that the only way to solve a problem is to crack down on it, either shoot it, either punch it, I don't know. We don't think this is a very constructive way to solve a problem. Go. Um, they keep on asserting that we're like not going to have any human peace officers. These are going to be used to aid with the peace officers, and we're not asking them to have like a team right. or any of those laws. This is a major flaw in their case. First of all, if robots are so great, why don't we exclusively have robots? We don't see why. Secondly, they haven't told us yet where are we going to exactly use the robots. What are we going to use them for? Never told us that. They said winter is a threat, but a threat in itself can be many, it can be a lot of things. They need to explain to us where exactly can we use the robots? Because even in the suicide bombing, they said a police officer is good. Well, why can we use the robot then? They need to explain us that. But the second thing they talk to us is that they can cooperate with the police, which is just got um, a PY about, right? But firstly, we say that, well, there shouldn't be necessarily police officers if robots are so great. But secondly, we think that the police are con concede to this danger when they take this job. But thirdly, more importantly, we think that the police um, organization as a whole is going to be severely worsened. What do I mean by this? We think that the police officers are going to be really mad at the uh, robots because of three things. Firstly, they're taking their jobs. Secondly, we think that they're being overruled in some cases, maybe not all, by the robots. And thirdly, we think that because they're inhumane and can't really talk to them, we think that it's going to create a distance between the police officers and the robots, mainly because they're taking the jobs, what and so on. What does this mean, ladies and gentlemen? Because the police officers is now mad at these um, robots, it's going to create a distance between those two parties. What does that mean? It means that the police officers kind of have to prove that they're better than the robots in order to keep their jobs, right? What does that mean? It means that they have to do the robots' jobs even better. What is the robot doing? Going out and cracking down on threats. That means that the police officers is trying to do that job better. Oh, there's a threat. I'm going to have to crack down on it before the robot does. That means that all of the police officers suddenly are going out, cracking down on a minor threat because they need to keep their job because there's a constant competition between the police officers and the robots. We think this is only going to be worse in, 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 on the down line, right? We don't think that's good. Furthermore, they talked about that robots is safe, and they can make a cho choice to, like, furthermore, they talked about accountability, and the uh, uh, extension speaker came up and told us two things. First, we don't necessarily need accountability because we can just fix it, right? But no, we can't really fix it because still there's no definite law. It's not black and white. It's not saying, okay, we're going to fix it like that. That's not how it works in the, in the, in the in machines, right? We think that a working importance of law is not that not not that simple. So because of all the reasons we brought forth to you, I put I invite you to oppose. Thank you. In the Prime Minister's speech, we clarify the rules are used by only weeks, right? We don't allow commercially, we don't allow commercially sold predator drones. If someone gets their hand on them, we remotely scramble their hard drive, right? This is what we will do to, to those to those to those like um, laws if someone does get their hand on them, easy enough to deal with that, right? Some substantial rebuttal until I go, go on to my two main points of clash. Number one, how do we improve trust? 
Number two, who is better at the, the job of the police? We say robots primarily, but we say that that probably also works in conjunction with people where they are the independent people, right? Okay, so, so, so to get onto the extension that we've just, just heard. So the first threat that they describe is this idea that we might use it against demonstrations, right? Two replies. Number one, policing, like, like policing um, through like happening already happens, right? We already have police officers that, 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 like, that, that, that work um, towards trying to get those demonstrations not to occur. We say, secondly, on the same story, there's a lot of antagonism because of that, no thank you. We have those police officers who do those happening, right? Um, of people who are demonstrating have, have, have like biases towards them, things like privilege, are, are, are an equation in that we say that that no longer happens on the our side. Why? Because those robots don't have those same emotions, right? They don't feel that privilege is something problematic. That antagonism isn't spread, right? We say we are much better at dealing with, with demonstrations if they go if they go uh, in a way place that we don't want them to go. Like that's not a problem, right? We say they, they, they then say that, that there might be a problem with robots acting in a bad way, right? We say two again, two responses. Number one, it's very unlikely, right? Given that we program them in a way that has to be transparent, as Dublin points out. You, we know exactly what type of code we put into them, and yes, obviously we're running tests on them. But secondly, even if that does happen, we say that it's far more likely to be detected. So what do you get? You get a court process, you get people having to defend why that code went wrong, and then you get those 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 robots being taken out and scrambled, right? We say we can deal with with, with, with bad situations far better than on the status quo, where the police constantly get into situations like Ferguson, right? That, that go tremendously wrong, and we are not able to deal with them in the long run, because they reoccur, right? Um, okay, then they say, human beings are better placed than, thank you, uh, to interpret laws, right? Like, you notice, we have voted to have those laws in the first place, right? We say the, the way that police officers apply them is completely on a whim. We say that's not something we want. We want, we want consistency, which is something we can only get with robots, right? Um, like, thank you. We, we say that robots don't take prejudice into account to the same extent that the police officers do. When we see minorities um, uh, like, like being treated differently um, all over the world, no, thank you. The last thing they say, um, there's going to be a significant distance between the police officers and the robots. They're going to compete in some way, and that will make the police like worse. Right? Again, two responses. We say probably not. Unions under the status quo are currently lobbying to, to, to keep no-go areas, no-go areas, right? Where a police officer goes into and is immediately shot, they don't want them to engage with. What does that lead to? It leads to massive distrust in the government because the government is not doing anything in those areas. We say we say that we say that that no longer happens. Why? Because it, it's not a problem if a robot gets shot. We just send a few more in. We repair them as we pointed out, right? We say we can then actually interact in those areas where people feel let down by the government, right? We say that in the long run. That actually leads to no distance. More importantly, unions will like those robots, right? Because it means that you have cooperation with, with, like, with a separate part of the police force in order to interact with those no-go zones, right? We say there's probably no hostility of anything. There's cooperation because they can be utilised. Uh, no thank you, right? So how do we improve trust? We say that like it's it's completely like been straw manned as to what we said and how we get like as to what we said as to how we get <laughs> distrust and why that distrust is there. We say there's a few things, right? Number one. It stems from the fact that the police are often corrupt and racist, right? When they say that that highlights them, like it highlights adversary when we put those robots in, no, the adversary is there under the status quo. When those, when, when those like, for example, minority groups, but also that this idea that there's corrupt, corrupt, um, uh, corrupt police officers um, are not really engaged with. We say that doesn't happen with with those robots. But more importantly, Duncan told you that like that the problem is that there's a balance that needs to be struck between self-defense and intervention at the hand of the state, right? We say that in a lot of cases we can see that that goes in favour of self-defense and self-protection in situations where like the policemen don't want to take a risk. We say not only does that have an immediate uh, um, did, like the, does that bring immediate distrust between the mothers of children who haven't been sent who haven't been saved from burning buildings, right? But it also brings distrust on a far wider scale when we can see that the media is reflecting upon the police as being non-accountable, as being something that is damaging. We say that that means that across the US people are feeling that that like that the police is not the type of uh, law force that they want, they can't trust it. And it is not accountable, right? Before I go on, yeah. But how do you guarantee that the government will not manipulate this machinery for, to, for example, persist their bias for protest groups that they particularly are not fond of? Right. So we say, we say, 
Like, that, that is a non-comparative harm. Why? Because they can already do that, supposedly, with a peace force, a peace force that understands the world. More importantly, they can actually corrupt, corrupt those peace forces and interact with them. We say that can't happen when you have a transparent coding machine, code that everyone can see. We have like, courts that literally know exactly what goes into those robots under our side, right? We say that, no, thank you, when you have corrupt police uh, officers and the head of like, a, a local estate in, in the US, that is far more likely to happen than under our side when they essentially manage and those biases are gone because those biases will not be programmed as we say as government into those machines, right? Okay. We say we say accountability, no thank you. We say accountability plays heavily into trust as Duncan's point of view, right? We, like, we, we say that accountability is a problem under the current system, where we say that like we, we need to put cameras in place, for example, uh, in order to see whether whether peace forces really act in the way that we want them to act. But more importantly, we, we, we don't really have a mechanism in order to like like there's no police officer that is like fired from from from, from like a jury, right? We say we say that that is different under our side of the house, right? We say that accountability immediately stems from the fact that they don't have that freedom, right? We say the police officers do have a freedom to interpret the law in the way they want, right? And they don't have a check and balance system. We don't have that with machines. More importantly, they're far better at reflecting the law immediately, right? Because they, they know everything as the, this everything programmed into them. That is not that is not the case with the police officers, right? The police officers might be able to list the law of their local the their local community, but they might not in the US especially know every single law there is, right? We say that makes them not the law more accountable but also more effective. We say they're probably better than people, right? We say the opposition leaders list examples of suicide bombers, like they say that they, like, where they say people are better. Number one, we say what people can do in those instances, like negotiate, we can also ask robots to do. Second, robots might be better at dealing with the situation, right? Instead of negotiating with a suicide bomber, they probably really need to quickly disarm that bomb. But thirdly, even if people are better in some instances, we have already told you we're willing to, like, co cooperate with them and, inc and include them in the peace force anyway, right? So none of those things are actually hard, right? Because of all the reasons we've given you, like, it's just a good idea to implement <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, what team proposition has to prove in today's debate is essentially just one thing, that robots are more effective than human police officers. They have failed to do this. Instead, they have only pointed out flaws of human officers, which we on team opposition, uh, on the other hand, only recognize as important benefits of actually having human officers. And that's why we're so proud to oppose today's motion down the bench. Now, what we on the, hand, on the other hand, as opposition has to prove, is that human police officers are more efficient than robots. And furthermore, we have proven to you that this resolution, if being passed, will actually lead to an unsafe society. Now, I'm going to uh, show you how we won on both these parts and how we've proven that uh, human beings are more safer and more accountable than robots by asking two questions in my work speech. Firstly, can we trust robots? And second, I'm going to look at the uh, closing half of the debate uh, and ask the question, which side of the house creates a safer society? So, the question of, can we trust robots? In here, the proposition gave the point about how robots are being effective. Here, they pointed out flaws about, no thank you, about human office in the status quo. They gave you the idea that robots have no feelings, no stress, no physical limitations. We say that these are the things that actually make them uh, like non accountable and actually unsafe. No, thank you. We say that the fact that actual human being police officers have emotions is what makes them effective in situations. We were given like the idea that robots would be put in, in like hostage situations. Hostage situations, like my partner Andreas pointed out, is like a very delicate situation. He analyzed the nature of a general situation. There are several things to be taken into account. If you just uh, as I quote the second speaker of the proposition, no thank you. If you just shoot first and ask questions later, that could have several implications for the hostages, no thank you, and cause severely harms to the police yeah. officers themselves, no thank you. 
So we say the fact that human beings are actually able to analyze the situation and comprehend human emotions is what, is what makes them uh, like more effective and actually accountable. So then we give you like the idea of banking that is very important to have human offices because people need to identify with their uh, law offices. No banking. We say that the people have no incentive to actually aid like these robot offices in their investigations because they cannot read them, they cannot understand them. And like Palmer and Drake gave you the idea that that's actually going to be like no thank you harms from the collaboration between robots and human offices. We say that when we put them in a gang war, as they pointed out, that's going to be like severely harmed. Because you can't read a robot, you can't analyze the emotions of a robot. We're saying that no thank you, like a hostile situation with, for instance, a gang, would be increasingly hostile because they cannot see like whether or not this robot is actually threatening. Thus, they would probably react by shooting first and asking questions later, which in turn, no thank you, would only like increase uh, the hostility of the situation, no thank you, and in turn, like first, both the robot and like uh, the police officer. So we said that's very important to share human values and identify with your uh, law officer. Then the proposition gave you this weird point about minorities, no thank you, how black people are actually able to identify better with robots. We say that there's a fundamental flaw in their model, no thank you, uh, I'm sorry, but like, no thank you. We say there's a fundamental flaw in their model. They told you that these robots are going to work in conjunction with officers. My partner Andreas told you why this was not work. Like in the status quo and under their models, well, no thank you, the majority of police officers will still be white, and since you cannot prosecute a robot, which proposition conceded to, no thank you, the fact victims, no thank you, can get no reparations if there's an uh, error occurring done by the robot. So in fact, this has done nothing in their model, no thank you, on this allows they're doing nothing to the minorities, their white officers will still be responsible, and they're actually taking the opportunity, no thank you, for victims being unjust treated to like get legal uh, reparation and actually prosecute the responsible. So we have told you, no thank you, that we cannot trust robots, that robots actually will have harm to police work in general, since minorities will not trust them anymore, no thank you, and this will be like uncertain to put in various hostile situations, no thank you, like uh, like hostile situations, like gang wars. So let me uh, ask the second question, which side of the house creates a more safe society? Here they have the point of this side of the house about how like, we're reducing harms to the police. Uh, but before I ask this question, you would disagree. Okay, so if you're a member of a minority group that experiences systematic police discrimination, why wouldn't you want to have the first arbitrator there to accept the situation as possible? Because we're saying that the people like the opposite, uh, like going into these situations with uh, this robot, this lower robot, is still going to be white. We're saying that they're still living in like a white society who is the one controlling these robots. Like, they are being programmed, no thank you, by a majority, which the minority is not a part of. So thus, they're no different at all on this side of the house. Now, which side creates a safer society? Now, we told you, uh, on our side of the house, um, in our extension, uh, my partner Andreas pointed out that this will actually have like increased implications on several levels. Now, they said that the famous, uh, like this robot technology wouldn't uh, dilute into like a private market, but we see this as a fundamental flaw. No, thank you. Because we see that a lot of police technology actually flow into the private market. There's a lot of civilians have access to both police guns and even uh, like police uh, radios, police phones. No, thank you. So we say that this will happen. No, thank you. We say that like the uh, private market uh, will no thank you will get access to this. And this has like several uh, the case to my partner very stress. But even if it won't get into like a private market, the black market definitely will get a hold of this technology. And this will lead to the criminals not hiding a shotgun in their closet, but actually hiding a lethal robot. This will not create a safer society. This will only increase crime and give criminals better like instruments to promote violence and um, and like harm police uh, officers even more, so thus their point about like uh, removing dangers to police officers falls even more. Then he gave you like this idea about totalitarian states also getting access to this technology because there is a market for lethal robots. There is a market for lethal weapons, and Assad in Syria will definitely get a hold of this. Now, like he can't. Uh, he can, he can like oppress his population with lethal force, with systematic targeting of opponents, uh, and, like riots and stuff. And this will like create like uh, huge democratic issues and a very unsafe society. 
So because we told you that we can only trust the human officers, and because we told you that on this side of the house, they're going to create an even more unsafe society, and we are so proud to oppose. Thank you.